Let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Which, is, which partially was read to us in our responsive reading. We will look at verse 7 through 9. Uh, today as we talk about spiritual contentment. Lord, help us in this hour to rightly divide your word. We recognize that what we do is not man's work, but your work. That you've given to man to do. Speak as you will, O oh Father God, today. As you always do with clarity. That at our departure we will know. We've been in your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You know, we, we all have a tendency to sometimes... Forget God in the midst of our prosperity. And we also tend to forget God in when we are down and out. <laughs> we try to make things happen. We tend to live at these two extremes, don't we? Uh, contentment is not one of those glowing characteristics that most of humanity is known for. We live in a world that tells us, go for the gusto. A world that says, never be satisfied. But they mean it from a negative sense. Reach your full potential, but they mean it in terms of worldly possessions and gathering whatever we can in this life and do not extend that to spiritual things. Uh, this prayer here by Agar is really a prayer about finding that contentment. It is having that right balance in life where... Um, we would call it being comfortable. Amen? But that's not what he's talking about. Content being comfortable. Being content is not always comfortable, as we'll learn here. It means that we are where God wants us to be. We've got what God wants us to have. And we're serving God the way we ought to serve Him. We're coming close to the end of another year that God has given us here at New Harvest. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we content in the Lord? Uh, we can't serve God unless we're content, spiritually content. Uh, when we're spiritually restless, we're always looking for what God has for us instead of doing what God has for us. As we close out the year, uh, we should be reviewing even now, what have we done this year in our own personal life that has moved the mark down a little bit further? We are like athletes in a relay race. We've received the baton from others. What are we passing on? Have we gained some ground when we pass that baton to others? I want to talk about spiritual uh, commitment. Use these, the text before us to do it. And, and I think the prayer is one that seeks to please God with a life, with his life. And in that he's accurately aware of his weaknesses and his inability to rightly judge 
where the place of contentment is. We must be content. But what makes content different than being comfortable is being comfortable is what we define. Being content is what God defines. And all of us, I can remember as a young boy, we, most of us, if we grew up a little poor, we, we, we wanted to be rich. And then as we grew older and saw that we weren't going to be rich, we just said we want to be comfortable. <laughs> Euphemism for rich. <laughs> Amen. Uh, so let us delve into our lesson today in verse 7. It says, there are two things I have required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Uh, you think about what most people want out of life before they die. We don't like to talk about death. We don't like to talk about dying, but we ought to. Because we're all going there. And one of the reasons we don't like to talk about dying because it reflects on what we're doing now. It, 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 it sheds a light on the activities of my life, uh, my thoughts in this life, what are my goals in this life. Money probably would be at the top of the list for many people. We want more money. Uh, having a bigger house might be on the top of the list. Amen. It's really interesting how folks in their 20s and their 30s, they want a bigger house. By the time they get to their 60s and 70s, they want a smaller house. <laughs> Why don't you just get a small house and be content? <laughs> and, and aren't we something? We're just never satisfied. Even when we get what we want. <laughs> What am I going to do with this big house? Well, that's what you said you wanted. <laughs> now nah, it's too much to handle, isn't it? You know, third place uh, uh, in, in our list of what we want might be friends. You know, we want good friends. And uh, some of the young folk might say, well, I want an attractive spouse <laughs> and a family. Uh, I want a nice car. I want to see the world. I mean, there's a whole list of things we want to do and people say they want to do before they die. But they're all things that involve the here and the now that do not reflect any kind of thought for when I'm going to die. Have no thought for the future at all. It's all about... I want to settle up now. I, before I die, this is what I want to do. But the focus is on the now. Agar is focusing on the future. And he says, I've got, I'm going to die. I've got so much time. I want to use my time, Lord, for you. I, I, want, I want to use it for you, but I don't know how to use that time in a way that would be pleasing to you. Now, don't you think about that? You know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We know all of the relevant scriptures along the faith line, but but Agar here is is kind of saying, "Hey, look at here, Lord. I I I I, I want to be content because we are as beings restless. We are very restless. We're we're grabbing at things." Uh, and, and don't even know why we're grabbing and what we're grabbing for. We, we really don't. What do people really want? Most of the time we, we have a hard time trying to figure out what we want for dinner. Now think about that. We, we don't know what we want. And one of the reasons we complain so much is because we don't know what we want. And so, so everything becomes a complaint. 
everything becomes a problem. Everything becomes an irritant because we're, we're discontent with ourselves. We're restless. We're not spiritually content. We don't, we're not serving God's purpose whatsoever. We're talking about it. We're thinking about it. We're praying about it. And just as restless spiritually as we've ever been. I imagine that's where Agar was. You know? In his pursuit of this spiritual contentment that we all need to have, but for which you and I don't know how to get there. So this prayer then becomes very practical for us. Let's go to somebody who does know. <laughs> Amen. Now he says, deny me them not before I die. And again, that's a sensitivity to death. I, I tell you, as we get older, we get a little more sensitive to death. Amen. Now some of us still sticking our head in the ground and, and not being sensitive. But uh, newsflash, we ain't got as far to go as we've been. Amen. We've already passed the halfway point. Some of us done passed the three-quarter point. <laughs> some of us is at the 90% point. <laughs> and some of us are standing there looking down in it. <laughs> it's getting close. You know? It's getting close. And, and the reason, again, as I said before, the reason we back off from that because it, it, it goes back to what I'm doing now. And I'm seeing what I'm doing now tells me I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready yet. Well, what are we doing to get ready? <laughs> deny me them, deny me them not before I die. In other words, plot a course for the rest of my life. Not a point in time, but for the rest of my life. Lord, plot this course for me. Help me to be content where I am that I can devote more of myself to you. And so he's living his life the way you and I ought to live our lives. How is that? In light of eternity. That's really how we ought to be doing that. Now, some of us would, 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 might feel uncomfortable because, you know, we want to have a good time now. Amen? We really want to have a good time now. And not understand that when I am in the center of God's will, when, when, when I am serving God with all I have, the joy that brings surpasses anything that I can get from worldly pleasures. See, the tug, the tug is not trusting God. The tug is, how can I serve God and still enjoy life? As if those two things are, are at opposite ends of the pole. They're not. Serving God is the joy of my life. When it is not, then I have a problem with contentment. Because I'm trying to do something, amen, I'm trying to split my life into two categories. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Isn't that what the Scriptures tell us? We know that while we're trying to find joy in the earth. Amen? Uh, most of the, the new technological advances that have come down to shoot in the last maybe 15 to 20 years or so, most of the new stuff is entertainment. Now, what you think about that? Amen? Every now and then a pot come out that maybe can cook better. <laughs> but for the most part, it's entertainment driven, isn't it? I'm discontent. I'm, I'm restless. I need something to amuse myself. Why? Because I'm not content with life. I'm not serving the Lord. What I grab for in the world isn't satisfying me. I'm restless. I'm restless. I'm restless. 
because I'm not living in view of eternity. And when I live in view of eternity, death has to come to light. Because that's the door I need to pass through to go into eternity. And we all are going to go through that door. Agar is concerned because of all the temptations this world offers. And how easy it is to get buried in and blinded by self-indulgence. That we focus so much on the here and the now with no regard for the life thereafter. I, I, I don't know if today will change our minds or not, but I got to tell you something. <laughs> uh, if, we're, if we're not content, we're never going to get content until we start serving the Lord. Because we were made for the Lord. That's what we were made for. And we're trying to live our lives out of the will of God. Amen? And we've seen uh, in some circumstances, and some, sometimes we think this way, that if I, if I yield to the will of God, I'm going to be this sad ogre somewhere, and I can't enjoy anything. That's a problem inside. I'm hoping we see that. I know I'm kind of repeating that because I do want us to see that the problem is inside. When I'm serving the Lord, that is my joy. I'm not searching for these other things. Can I enjoy them? Certainly so. But I'm not chasing them down. I'm not running after them every day that I wake up. I have learned, and uh, uh, when I'm spiritually content, I've learned that balance because God has taught me that balance. Agar wants his life to count now. And when I want my life to count, you know, we got all these books out about finding our significance, finding our purpose. Boy, they come out, they're just the, the, there's a flood of them. Every now and then they come out about all of these things. Contentment, it, spiritual contentment, allows us to fulfill that purpose. Amen? Not just to find it, or have someone else define it for us, or have someone else tell us how to find it. Agar says, I, Lord, I, I need you. Not to deny me these things before I die. Because my spiritual contentment is not rooted in my definition of what contentment is, but in what your definition of contentment is. And that's what I want. See, this is something I got to want to have. Can't be imposed upon us. I've got to want it. And until uh, I want it, I, I will never go to the Lord the way I ought to go. And so are we actually living with a sensitivity towards death? A question that may sound very simple and the answers may be very obvious, but most people are living and have no idea why they wake up in the morning. None. And they're discontent. They're restless. When you wake up with purpose... Spiritual contentment, you don't do that. You got a path already cut for you. Whatever laying before us in that day, we're happy about it. Because we have found that purpose in our contentment, in our relationship with the Lord. Spiritual contentment gives us what? Peace. It gives us peace. <laughs> He says, remove from me. Now, he gets into this prayer. He says, you know, two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove from me vanity and lies. Remove vanity means to remove falsehood. Hoods. Passions of the old nature. Pride in one's place in this life. 
that cause us to seek the world's approval, admiration, and applause. Boy, isn't that us? Huh? That lets us know that we're, we're, we're not really content. Because we're not seeking to please God. I want all, I want to, I tell you what, I want to, I want to hear that Job thing. Amen. <laughs> have, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> Are you still chewing on that one? <laughs> have you considered my servant Job? Vanity is striving for that which is in fact worthless and in the end disappointing. Work all our life to get the big house. And in old age, we want the small house. <laughs> We're messed up. It, it, it doesn't satisfy inside like we thought it was going to satisfy. Amen? Now hold on because uh, I don't want you to jump back and say, well, now do I need to do this vow of poverty? We're going to get there. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about contentment. We're talking about that, that, that place of spiritual contentment where God says, when you're right here, you're in the center of my will, you're satisfied, amen? You're not necessarily comfortable, but you're satisfied. And it is in that place, and in, in that place alone, that you can serve me. Until I'm spiritually content, I can't serve God. I talk about serve God, serving God, I try to serve God, I get busy serving God, but I never serve God. Because I'm always looking for some other thing to do. Instead of settling down in what it is God called me to do. Amen? Even in business, even in, in business, the person who finds their little niche, the, the Kentucky Fried Chicken, when you go there, that's all you get is chicken. That's all you get. They do it every day, the same thing. They found their niche. They found their purpose. And they keep doing it day in and day out. And they're multi-million billionaires. Amen? Because they're doing what they have, have the purpose is. When we find our purpose, when we're content, with what God has given us and our talents and our spiritual gifts and we start applying those and we're contending that God can use us for great things. Not to make us great. I didn't say that. I said for great things. For His pleasure. For His glory. What do I mean? His power working through us that which is impossible for you and I to work through ourselves. The power of God going through us and in and, and spite of the old nature trying to come back in and do this and do that and tell us this, tap us on the shoulder there, try to get us to turn this way and that way. We stay on the straight and narrow. You know why we stay there? Because we're satisfied inside with what we got. And until, see we can't fake this one. You know the old saying, fake it uh, uh, till you make it. You can't fake this contentment. That's kind of, uh, to try to fake it will result in a, what we call a false humility, which everybody will identify as soon as they see it. It ain't true humility, it's false humility. Vanity is, relates to those pleasures in life that are, maybe appear a little bit innocent to us, but in reality, they obscure and they blind us to the hidden dangers behind the curtain. It's amazing how things that are sinful seem to be very pretty to the eye. Because, because it's hiding behind that all of those, all of that glamour, if you will, the danger. Vanity is anything that dulls or misleads our sound judgment. Van, vanity actually smothers wisdom. Because I'm seeking to be satisfied, now watch this, by nothing. That's what vanity is. It's nothing. It's worthless. And I'm trying to be satisfied by nothing. Think about it. As soon as I get it, I'm looking for another one. If I was satisfied, I, I wouldn't be doing that. 
Amen. Uh, as soon as I get this, I got to go, boy, I, I got that. I, I, I've done it. We do that a lot with clothes, don't we? We don't wear them out. <laughs> hey, hello? <laughs> My mother used to always get on me because I only had one pair of shoes. <laughs> and when the soles wore out, we would go down to the Frito place, get some cardboard, and put it in the bottom of them. And she would say, why didn't you tell me you had holes in your shoes? And I would say, because you're working too hard to be buying me new shoes. See, I, I, we got shoes when they were wore out. Now, I'm not setting myself up and say I was content then. There was another motive there, but it, it can be used as an example of how we, 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 we just get because we can get. Simply because we can. Well, I'm going to give all this away because, you know, I, perfectly good. Tag still, everything's there. Vanity. Vanity. Whatever we value is what we strive for. For, and that's manifested in every one of our lives. Amen? You say, well, I don't know what I value. Then just pull your checkbook out. That's all you got to do. <laughs> That'll tell you straight out what you value. What you value. Amen? Because whatever we value, there's no sacrifice too great to get it. None. We don't even think about it. Amen? It, it, there's no sacrifice. Vanity is never satisfied with material possessions. Surely we can conclude that. It's always reaching out for more. How many of us remember when we didn't have what we have today? We didn't have what we have today. And we ever thought, remember way back then? We thought if, if we could just move that, that thing about that much, we'd be happy. We done moved it way over here. Still not happy because we're not content with the Lord. It didn't satisfy. We're, we're still in a, in, in, a, in a pickle over that. Amen. And we come up with the same thing that, that Solomon came up with. And there's nothing that we do today that Solomon didn't do. I mean, he said, I gave myself to whatever pleasure I wanted. I just gave myself to it. Man, that just, that put us all under that umbrella. Amen. We're all different. He says, but at the end of it, it was all vanity and vexation of spirit. Vexation of spirit meaning that I was never settled with it. It didn't deliver what I wanted. My, my spirit was always in conflict with it. I was never settled whatsoever and so if we continuously define what we think is going to satisfy we continue to be haunted by disappointment he says remove from me vanity and remove from me lies he's kind of saying the same thing isn't he you see vanity says you can get this and it'll satisfy and it turns out to be a lie. <laughs> now this is important because he's asking God to do this which means he was vulnerable to vanity and these lies. That's what it means. It means that the old man can lie to you. Amen? I think it's just the, when he says remove lies, I think it's another way of saying, you know, vanity. Lies corrupt the heart. The heart lies when it says that you can take fire in your bosom and not be burned. Believing lies is the foundation of what? Self-deceit. The lie says there's nothing wrong with, what, with my thinking even when my thoughts oppose the clear word of God, and I don't even recognize that, that I'm opposing God. I don't even recognize it. 
Amen? You see the need for the prayer? See, God can open that up to us. The heart is the source of what? All lies. Every evil thought comes out of the heart. Only God can make the tree good. And I like that because it says, make the tree good and the fruit will be good. But the scripture also says, what man has cleansed, can say I've cleaned my own heart. So how, I can't make the tree good. I have to receive the good seed in good ground. Amen. And so God makes the tree good. And therefore the fruit of it is good because he's made it good. We must never underestimate then the power of deception. Because deception occurs when we don't even know it. It's occurring. The scripture says the deceived don't even know they deceived. And, and Agar is saying here, look at here, Lord, I, I can't know all this stuff, but you know it. You guide me in these areas. Don't let me be self-deceived. Don't let me listen to the lies that come out of my heart that tell me I can take in the fire and not get burned. Don't let me believe the lie that this is all there is to life. And there's nothing else. And that I must be a certain way to please all these people, Lord God. And that you somehow will be satisfied with that. After all, we're human. Never underestimate the power of self-deception. We can be deceived more easily than you ever thought we can be deceived. Amen. When Jesus tells us then to watch and pray, he's saying because the spirit is so willing, but the flesh is so weak. It is so easy. This is not external. This is internal self-deception. That's what this prayer is about. Keep me from that. Earlier, the wise man warns us to keep or to guard our heart with all diligence for out of it, are the issues of life. Guard our heart against what? Falsehoods. Against falsehood. The second part of the verse is actually the petition. However, the, the, this, this is kind of the setup what we've went through just now. He says, he says, remove far from me vanity and lies. Exactly what is he asking the Lord to do? He's asking the Lord to preserve him from deceiving himself. And he says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Wow. If we like that, say amen. amen. Okay, got 50%. That's good. <laughs> Give me neither poverty nor riches. When he said, Lord, give me, that took that out of the, his hands, didn't it? He says, I'm not going to decide. You decide. You decide, Lord God. See, that's a heart that's, that's out to please God. That's what that is, a heart out to please God. He does not desire to live on the verge of always wanting. That is being in poverty. He does not want to be filthy rich either. That busts the bubble of the prosperity ministry. That God wants us to be rich. It is interesting that both the poor and the rich live on the verge of want when they are spiritually, they have a spiritual deficit. The poor wants more food, wants more things. The rich wants more things, wants more lux luxurious foods. <laughs> Their heart is exactly the same. Why? Because there's a spiritual deficit. That's why. They're not, neither one of them are satisfied. And neither one of them are able to get satisfied. He's not praying to be poor as if being destitute either would enhance his spiritual relationship with the Lord. He's not vowing this vow of po poverty, as I uh, mentioned earlier. He does not ask to be rich as if the abundance of material blessings validated his relationship with the Lord. Being rich doesn't mean that, that, that your relationship is right. Boy, this guy, this guy is smart. Isn't he? Why? Because God is guiding him to this prayer in the first place. 
And so he says one state is not to be preferred over another. I don't want to be, I don't want to be poor and I don't want to be rich. So there's a, there's a happy medium somewhere in there. Amen? Only God knows what our portion ought to be. Look at the second part of verse 8. Feed me with food. What's it say? Convenient for me. Give me my portion. Teach me contentment. Let me be content with what you put on my plate. <laughs> that assumes our plate is not already full with the junk food we put on it. He who finds contentment finds that medium between riches and poverty. Now think about this. This shouldn't be strange to us. Why? Because in, 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 in the model prayer, Jesus says we ought to pray, give us our daily bread. You know what he's saying when we pray that? Lord, just give me what I need today. Give me my portion today. That's the same thing that, 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 that Agar is, is praying. Just give me what is necessary today, both in what I'm eating in terms of food itself, but more so, Lord God, give me that, that, that spiritual fulfillment that I need for today, that I not be led into temptation, lies, and vanity, that I don't get trapped by what I see, that I turn from that. That it not grab my heart. Amen? Not too much, not too little, just right. And none of us know what the just right is. Do we? We really don't. Because we would we 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 could be the rich sitting there saying, now now I hadn't gone overboard. Well, that depends on whose perspective. <laughs> Amen. Next, he addresses the dangers of these two extremes. And he is talking about the extremes, by the way, of being too, uh, exorbitantly rich or, or, or just so poor that things don't go right with us. And so he talks about, first, these uh, dangers of riches. He says, least I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? How many have, have passed through here that riches got them? I can tell you, I could almost roll the names off. Business, 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 business. More money, more deals. Working seven days a week. Why? For money. For money. And yet there's a spiritual deficit. It, one of the things that breaks my heart more than anything else is the Talk to somebody that's chasing money and they look in your eyes and you see the darkness there and you see them on the verge of tears and they look at you and they say, Pastor, I know, I know. And then I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. But. I know, but. There's always a but. There's a reason I've got to chase the dollar. There's a reason I've got to do this. It's always a reason. Never a reason to say enough is enough. Never a reason to say, hey, you know what? If I've got to lose that business, that's okay. I, I, I want my relationship with God the way it ought to be. No, none of that. None of that. There's always a but. And the but is always in my favor. Isn't it? It's never... In favor of God. Now listen. You can't make folk love God. You gotta love Him. And when we love Him. That's where the contentment comes from. That's where it comes from. It's, it's not from a lesson or a sermon. It's because He died for me. I love Him. For who He is. And I'm content in Him. And these other things just don't mean anything to me. And I'm not going to let something chasing the dollar cause me to break my relationship with God. Hmm. 
Psalms 106 tells us something. Tells us about a people who got caught up in their prosperity, caught up in what God was doing. Till God said, they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and they tempted God in the desert. Now listen to this. And he gave them their request. But he sent leanness into their soul. Got it all. God says, that's what you want out of life. I'm going to let you have it. If that's all you want out of life. And he did that not to trick them, but to show them that when they got it, they would still be empty without him. You got to love him, church, for, for a message like this to get down in there and, and, and for us to, to really see what's going on. You got to love him be, just because he is who he is. The psalm says they were not estranged from their lust. In other words, they just kept on, they wanted more. The more God gave, the more they wanted. Until judgment came, and it says, but while the meat was yet in their mouths, judgment came. Exorbitant riches has a host of problems. The danger of becoming self-reliant, the danger of greed, the danger of covetedness. People become rich, why? Because they want to satisfy some niche, and they think the more money they got, the more they can satisfy that niche. That's the only reason to have it. Amen? It's past being comfortable. Amen. It's trying to fulfill a niche. Now listen. We're not saying there's something in just wrong automatically with being rich. That is not what this is about. That is not what this is about whatsoever. Amen. But there are inherent dangers to being rich. Self-conceit, a lack of compassion. We hear a lot of philanthropists, they give and they give and they give and they give. Some have compassion, others just do it as a tax break. But no real compassion. Some of us have a capability of doing more than what we do. But the, the compassion is what, what this is, the lack of compassion is what riches do for us. Because after all, we work hard for our money. <laughs> Amen? I'm always amazed at that because folks always talk, talk about how hard they work for money and then they go buy, out, go buy something, right? They walk out the store and it's worth zero. <laughs> Amen? At least you buy a car, it depreciates a little bit. You go buy some of this consumer stuff, you walk out the store with it and, and the value of that thing's zero. I'm working on a message on debt. <laughs> And, and how we're slave to debt. See, that, that's why he's saying, hey, don't let me get there. Sometimes we're in poverty because of our own foolish decisions. Because of our own indebtedness. We become a slave. In other words, we are, we are we, you, you know, debt is, is not in and of itself bad. Unsecured debt is bad. Unsecured debt means that if something goes wrong, I don't have the, unsecured means if something goes wrong, I don't have the money to pay it. And I don't have the assets to sell to pay it. Amen. But debt in itself, you know what it does? When we get upside down, it's saying, I'm going to buy something today for dollars I make tomorrow. <laughs> now think about that for a minute. Now the same responsibilities I have today, I'm going to have tomorrow. And at some point, when I borrow beyond what I'm making and start to mortgage tomorrow's money, I then become a slave to the lender because now I don't have a choice of where my money's going. And yet, and yet, I still have a responsibility for my bills. I still have to pay this and pay that and pay this. And then at a certain point, I can't do it. And I'm in bondage. 
So what do we do to get out of it? We borrow more. <laughs> we borrow more. I know folk who, who, whose whole life is based on that. And, the, and they will die in debt. Don't care. Don't care. Don't, don't let me be full, he says. Don't let me be so full that, Lord, I just forget who you are because I'm relying on myself. As Proverbs 18, 11 says, the rich man's wealth is his strong city and as a high wall in his own and is an high wall in his own conceit. He thinks he's somebody because he's got it all. Doesn't need you, don't need me. He can buy whatever he needs. Amen. The dangers of excessive riches is told to us in, in, in Tim, verse Timothy, in Timothy 6 and 10. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covered after some, there it is, some, not all, they err from the faith and are pierced through with many sorrows. Folks get rich and then they, they, they spend the rest of their life trying to hold on to it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Rest of their life trying to hold on to it. See, and that's, that's, where, that's where the lack of compassion goes, comes into it. Because they don't know what's sufficient for themselves. And so they can't have compassion on anybody else because they're too busy holding on to their, to their wealth. Are you, are you with me here? He says, don't, don't, don't let me be rich, but don't let me be poor either. He says there, or at least I be poor and steal and take the name of God in vain. So th there's a problem with excessive riches and there's a problem with, with being destitute. Have you ever heard the saying, I'm too poor, I'm too poor to be honest? That's an old saying. Some of us maybe never heard that before. What it means is that a person is so poor, he's going to go out and do whatever they need to do. Maybe you've heard this one, you know, whatever it takes. I bet we've heard that. That's a modern version of that. So the poor, poor person would say, hey, look at here. I'm going to eat no matter what it takes. If that means robbing from you, whatever it takes. If, if that means going into a store and, and, do, and, and taking what's not my, whatever it takes. Amen. And so that it's a kind of a proverb. The poor is, the poor is too, uh, being too poor to be honest. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> a man has to do what he has to do. <laughs> being, being destitute of basic needs leads to inner resentment and temptations to be dishonest. He says, I don't want any of those excesses. <laughs> We can learn then from the short verses that contentment in the Lord is how we strike the balance. Lately, we've been talking a lot about spending time with the Lord alone and thinking. And really, really thinking about where it is that we've drifted from. Where, where have we drifted from and why are we where we're at? Some have taken heed and their lives are changing. And as, the, as, as our lives are changing, there, there will become this overwhelming contentness in the Lord. Where we once again rely on Him. We're not worried about this. We're not agitated about this. We don't knee-jerk this one and knee-jerk that one. We're just steady in the Lord. Lord, you make it clear. And if it ain't clear, I ain't jumping. If it ain't clear, I ain't going, Lord. I'm just going to, I don't know what's going on, Lord, but you're not making that thing clear to me. You haven't showed me a path to go down. I'm not doing it. That's spiritual contentment. Spiritual contentment frees us from covetedness. It frees us from envy and jealousy where we look at others and want what they have. It liberates us from worldliness and it opens us up to the things of God. What a lesson to learn from this. 
but it all presupposes I love the Lord. Amen. It's not a formula. It means that it, we're sharing this to see what contentment looks like and how it actually works in our life. It does something. It keeps us away from the things that God says are evil, covetedness, greed, jealousy, envy. He says, let that stuff not be named among you, not even once. Spiritual contentment finds its sufficiency in God, says 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Lord, you're enough. You are enough. We don't have to define that, do we? You're enough. That's a reality. Spiritual contentment allows us to deal with then whatever life dishes out to us. After all, what more do we deserve than what we have right now? Source of complaints again. We think we deserve better. When we're content in the Lord, we know we've got better. So it doesn't, my state doesn't define my contentness. Contentness is not laziness either. As you, if you keep reading Proverbs 30, you'll find that out. It is not laziness. Contentment is believing that God knows what I need and will provide for me that which is proper for me. He will give me my portion. Are you with me still? Like Paul, we need to learn to be content. He says in Philippians 10, 13, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. For I have learned in whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. I know, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's about spiritual contentment. Whatever our state is. You see, but the prayer said, Agar was saying, don't make me poor and don't make me rich. I also said he didn't say, he wasn't talking about being comfortable. Amen. He wasn't talking about being comfortable. There's going to be times when all of us go through these little trials of want and prosperity not necessarily material things but sometimes things are just going good for us <laughs> amen Paul said when things are going good I'm, I'm content you know I'm not looking for anything else I'm not expecting anything else he told the church he says you know you owe me but I ain't gonna I ain't gonna I'm not gonna charge you anything because you guys are too stuck up <laughs> <laughs> you know you, 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 uh, you know you ain't paying me nothing God didn't call me I ended with that because I wanted to show us that Paul said, I have learned to be content. Today may be the beginning of that learning process. It may be a continuation of the process if we've already gotten to that place. Because this is, this is something I think we ought to pray every day. Why? Because the Lord has put it in the model prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Father, let thy will be done in us as it is in heaven. How can that be except I'm, I'm content in what the Lord's going to give me today? And in that will, sometimes things ain't going to work out the way I think they ought to work out. But the hunger that I suffer is going to draw me to the Lord. Sometimes things are going to be just going real fine. And when they are, 
I'm going to be giving thanks to the Lord. But I'm going to be content. I'm going to be content in all things. Amen? Stand with us. Before I pray, I'm, going to, I'm just going to read our text for the day. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Least I be full and deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? Least I be poor and steal and take the name of, of God in vain. Father, we acknowledge this is a work that only you can do in us. We acknowledge that it is a work that can only be done in those who love you. Teach us to love you. For to love you, Lord God, fills every part of our life. Your love, Lord, your acceptance. So as we go out today, Lord, Father, give us understanding in all that you teach us. That we may stand and be strengthened and glorify you in the life that we live today. We ask it in Jesus' name. And for his name's sake, we say amen.